passion for the mafia. And I think I'm part of the good, the bad, and certainly the ugly. In my time, in the heydays, there was bodies all over the place. When you make a mistake, I'm going to be the last face you see. It's not the guy who pulls the trigger you got to worry about. It's the guy who plans it. What are the biggest differences between you and Gotti? I did so many things for this guy. I rigged the trials. I threatened people. I fucking bribed people. And he turns on me. Doesn't history repeat itself? What if Sammy takes me out? What do you want me to be? I'm a gangster. How do you call the shots on who shoots? Look at the whole fucking picture. You don't think this guy's got balls? You want me to tell this kid to go back and kill Don King? It's all greed. It's all about money. What do you know about what happened with John F. Kennedy? This is going to sound fucking crazy, I think. Are you following any of the Epstein stuff? There isn't even a word for this piece of shit. Teddy Atlas said you went up to him to want to train with him boxing. Teddy Atlas is an asshole. Take away guns from all the good people. I will always have a gun. If I die tomorrow, this was my choice, my life. You still trust people? It's in every book, every movie. It shocked the whole world, what I did. No regrets. Sammy DeBoer Gravano did an exclusive interview was with Diane Sawyer on primetime TV back on April 16, 1997. Sammy is known as the hitman's hitman. He was the underboss to the leader of Gambino family, John Gotti. Sammy, thanks for making an attempt to do this interview. It's my pleasure. So, Sam, a lot has changed since uh, 1997. We now have uh, social media. We now have smartphones. We now have everybody having a camera. A lot's changed in America. We have a Donald Trump as a president, so... America's changed, world's changed. Has Sammy the Bulgarano changed? To an extent. I mean, I didn't change much, like people would think. I'm more coming out into a legitimate business and going into Hollywood, into a certain things that I'm doing in my life now. I've changed my life. I still have passion for the mafia, from where it came from, how it started, how it existed. It's part of my heritage. It's not just a gang to me. I was in a gang when I was young, but this isn't a gang. This was part of my heritage. It started in Sicily in the 12th century. It fled to the United States. Now, when I said it fled, it didn't come here because they liked the United States. They were running away from Mussolini and fascism, and it made them come to the United States. And they landed in the United States, and everything that they were taught in Italy, they brought them here. So I have a different feel for it. Now, there's some stuff that's ugly that we did, and I think I'm part of the good, the bad, and certainly the ugly. But I did this because of my belief in Goza Nostra. I've changed my ways, and I've moved on with my life, and I'm going in a different direction. Even sitting here talking to you, that's something that you're not supposed to do in Goza Nostra. You're not supposed to talk about it. When you flip or cooperate, whatever you want to call it, you're allowed to do whatever you want because you already broke the golden rule by cooperating. So, but if you didn't flip, then you're not allowed to do this because giving up our secrecy, we're a secret society and a brotherhood. And if you give up the secrets, there's no different than taking the stand or doing whatever. You can't give up the secrets of goes in Austria. Even some of the things that John Gotti did running as boss and people cheer about what he was doing he did more damage to Goza Nostra with being out there and putting it on Front Street than 10 cooperating witnesses put together. You believe that? Oh, absolutely. Why do you believe that? Most of the real gangsters believe that and know that. I've got 22 years in prisons. I bumped into a lot of guys. And I bumped into people and I said, listen, you were in a regular prison. Now you're in a witness unit. Tell me the truth. What were they saying about me? You were with this guy and this guy and this guy. This guy, Bobby, he was the underboss in Boston. And he told me, Sammy, you want to know the truth? I hear more crying and complaints about John than you. The position he put you in, and he betrayed you. When he betrayed you like that, it was the same as a rat move. 
In other words, the government is trying to put us away. That's their job. Your job as John Gotti is not to put me away. And if that's the role you're going to take so you can get out and I can take the weight, that's a ramble. What happened between me and John, so I did what I did, and, uh, and now I'm going into a whole different thing. That's all behind me. I see what they do now. I think they're pretty smart now. They went away from violence. They don't do that as much anymore. When I was in my time in the heydays in the 70s and 80s, there was bodies all over the place by every different family. But today, they don't do that. Does it work without violence and structure, though? Isn't uh, a part of uh, the leverage to impose fear? It could be, but it doesn't have to be. Fear could be in a, in a whole bunch of ways. Let's say you're a made guy. You're a friend of ours. A friend of ours is a made guy. Okay. You're a friend of ours. So you're not going to abide by the rules. But you're not too worried because I'm not going to kill you. But I could chase you. I could get out to all five families. He's no longer a friend of ours. Don't treat him like that. You're thrown out. Now that's a big hit. So you lose your power and nobody will respect you. Nobody will sit with you. Nobody will recognize you. Sometimes in certain cases, it may even be better to be dead. It's a good punishment, but the effect of not killing. When I was around, every family had a squad of FBI agents who worked on them, each family. The squad consisted of 20 some odd agents working on your family. From what I hear now, they're down to three. They used all those extra agents to terrorists and 13, drug gangs, stuff that warrants it. So by them not killing, they don't have the pressure. And then the RICO law and the laws are crippling. So me, you, and another guy, we all trust each other and we go on a murder. Now, the way the law is set, you get convicted on a murder, there's life without parole. Every one of us have a get out of jail card free. Of course, we kill Joe Blow, I get pitched for drugs later, and I'm facing 20 or 25 years. I'm 50 years old. Mm. I don't want to do it. So I go, the government, me, you, and this other guy, we killed him. They don't trust each other no more because the sentences are so big in most cases that guys flip. Some guys don't want to go to jail. Some guys are screwed when they go to jail. You know, I've heard so many stories with guys, black guys, Hispanic guys, who stood up and got sentenced and were doing their time. What did the people do? They took his money while he was gone. They screwed his wife. They did this. They did that. You're begging for this guy to cooperate. He didn't cooperate. And you do these things to him? So he flips. Or you sold him out in some capacity. And he flips. Like I did. When John, John told me to my face at the end of the time, he said, Sammy, the tapes are horrible. They sound, make you sound like a monster. What are we going to do? So I'm controlling all the lawyers. You're going to take the weight. The, the, the lawyers are going to bring it out in court that you're a monster. You killed all these people, took over the unions, took over businesses, which I never did. During the trial, the lawyers will say, you hear John complaining on the tapes. Poor John Gotti. He lost control of this monster. Sammy the ball. It's him. It's not John. So I will go free, and you'll do the time. I said, are you sure that's what you want me to do? In other words, I, I, I worry about the feds trying to put me away. I've been pinched all my life. I've faced that. I never faced my friend, my co-defendant, wanting to put me away. That's what they're doing, John. Is that what you really want to do? It has to be done. The streets needs me, the boss. You're the sacrificial lamb. I said, okay, you're sure. But that's the way it is. And I got in touch with the FBI. I flipped and I was gone. That's when I did my first bid of five years. Then I was out for a while, five years. And I went back in on a 20-year sentence. And that sentence, when I started that sentence, I did 17 years, several months on that sentence. The first six and a half years, I did in the hole. And I got sick in the hole. It took my teeth away, nails. It pre-aged my skin. Most of my hair was lost. And there were reports. He's dying of cancer. He's dying of... Hashimoto's disease, he, all these different things were coming out. But I survived it, and I'm back out, and I'm making my life again. Look who I am. I'm sitting with you talking. It's interesting. But going back, uh, what I'd want to do is pre-even this, I'm curious to know about the Sammy growing up. Like, 
you growing up in a family in Brooklyn, your mom, your dad, two sisters, I think you're the youngest of three. Right. Who was Sammy growing up? What was your personality like? Even at 10 years old, 12 years old, I'm not even talking 16, in high school with the incident of you and your principal, you know, you punching him in the face. Who were you at 8 years old? Who were you at 10 years old? I think I was just like any other kid. I was dyslexic. I was a very slow learner with books, not visual things or hearing things, but with books, stuff like that. The number three looked like an eight, so I was always wrong. So as soon as the teacher said, what number is that? Now, if it looked like an eight to me, I would say three. You're right. Not because I was right, but because I was wrong so many times. So an eight, I knew it wasn't eight, it was three. And vice versa. And I, I hung out with kids. And I grew with kids. I mean, just like any other kid. My father was a painter. Then he got lead poisoning and he couldn't paint. There, there was used to be lead in the, in the paint. My mother was a seamstress. So she was so good at it, she worked in a factory in New York for a Jewish contract. She used to make the dresses for the models that they were going to show the thing and sell it. So the contractor told her, Katie, her name was Kay, and they called her Katie. Why don't you open up a small little factory? You're great at this. So she talked to my father. He couldn't paint no more. So they opened up a small little factory together. They knew all the Italian people, all them ladies from Italy who was here. They all know how to sew. And they all went in there and sewed, and they had a little dress factory. And then we used to go in and help from time to time. And I wasn't the youngest of three. I was the youngest of five. My brother died and one of my sisters died before I was even born. And what was left was two sisters. One was nine years older than me, one was five years older than me. Did that feeling of you not getting A3, you know, I see this dyslexic, did that create any rage in you? Like I'm a little bit different, why am I being treated this way or not at all? No, no, there was plenty of rage. There was plenty of Absolutely. rage. Absolutely. Since I got left age? back in the fourth grade. Okay. I don't even know how old you're supposed to be in the fourth grade, but I got left back in the fourth grade. So now when I go forward, they're, they're younger than me. And the teacher would say a, a certain word, a big word, ask somebody to spell it. I was in the back of the class all the time. And another kid to spell another word. They would get to me and say, okay, Gravano, spell cat. The whole class would giggle. I was so ashamed and rage I felt. After school, I beat the shit out of everybody. I was actually older and bigger than them, and I was a strong kid. I beat the shit out of all of them. There was no more laughing. When I hit the seventh grade, I got left back again. And at that point, I said, school's not for me. It's just not for me. And I hardly went. I used to play hockey all the time. And one day, that's how that thing started with it and the teacher. I got caught by truant officers who went around and caught kids playing hockey. And I was a little drunk. They brought me up to the principal. I was sitting in the principal's office and he was talking to the principal. And he was saying, this is what they are. The upbringing isn't there. He used the word greaseball. It's a slur, a racist slur against mm -hmm. black Italian people. That didn't bother me too much. But when he was saying what kind of people these people are, this is a result, these kind of kids. So I, at one point I got up and I said, this has nothing to do with my mother and father, the hardworking people. This has to do with me. He said something about my mother and father. Again, I cracked him and shot. I broke his jaw and I was thrown out of school. Months later, in front of the Board of Education, I was transferred to another school, McKinley Junior High School. It was in a different neighborhood, mostly Irish, Polacks. The Irish and the Italian didn't get along at all. I wasn't a bad looking kid. I got along with the girls. But not the boys. Every day I was in a fight, in trouble. Finally, I get thrown out of that school too. I did find a teacher in that school who really tried to help me, a Mr. Mindrak. I respected this guy. He knew I wasn't stupid. He just knew I had a learning problem. Matter of fact, he would even tell me, if you get frustrated, you want to walk out of the class, walk out. And I got to respect this guy a lot. And I actually wanted to make him look good. So I was trying to hang in, but... I flunked that school, and I was sent to 600 school. And that is all misfits. I was in that school. I think it was the first week, there was a guy sitting in front of me. He was dressed in, looked like a robe. And I said something funny. The class was laughing. 
and he tapped his book, his Bible, on my head, on my forehead. You shouldn't do this, and you're acting, you're the devil. After about the third or fourth time, he hit me on the head, and when he was talking, I hit him and knocked his ass out. I was thrown out again of 600 school. The Board of Education called me. I was under 16. They said, he's out, suspended. On his 16th birthday, you can come here and sign him out. We never want him back in regular school. And if you don't, we're going to put him in reform school. So the next step was, it's like a kid's jail. So my mother and father kept me out when I was 16. They went there and signed me out. So I felt rage. But what I felt, I felt and I saw the pain in their face. Like they want their son to be successful or do something. And I, I broke their heart. They never hit me. My mother hit me with brooms and mops and whatever. But my father never hit me. Family of love. They loved you. They, they loved me. They, they adored me. I was the only boy. I was a little boy. My sisters were older. They would take me. You know, they almost acted like a mother. One of them is five years older. One is nine years older. They're much older than me. Hmm. Then I found the gang, the rampers, a street gang, just like any other gang, I guess. Tough kids, we got together and fought and stole and did things. And to us, it was the right thing. We were doing the right thing. We were even helping our families who were broke. At this point, you're what, 17 years old? No, I'm even, I'm, I'm in, in a gang, I'm 14. Oh, 14, you're in a gang. 14, 15. Got it. So typically when somebody joins a gang, there's something missing in the house. Not a father figure or something like that, right? But you have a love, your mom hit you, your dad didn't hit you, typically it's the other way around. We'll forgive mom because it's mom. What could have been done to prevent Sammy Gravano from becoming underboss Sammy DeVoe Gravano. Could the system or anything been done to prevent it and squashed it right there and Sammy goes a different direction with his life? Or I don't do think, think so. Okay. I don't think so. First of all, my neighborhood was entrenched. You see the movies Goodfellas and all those. It was entrenched with street mafia people. Now, we weren't in the mafia at that age. We're together. Where is the ramp is? Fuck them and everybody else. We don't want to have nothing to do with them. But it's entrenched. After a while, they're, they're my idols, when I'm, especially at 17. And you look up to these people. If you didn't look up to them or you went overboard in some way, you got killed in those days. Mm. There was bodies all over the place back then. So whether you liked the guy or you didn't like the guy, you knew your place to get away from them. You know, I'll give you an example. One time, my father tells me in the dress factory, he's going to ship clothes tomorrow. He wants me to come in and help him clip some threads, put plastic over the dresses that they're going to ship tomorrow. I'm in the back doing that. I see these two big guys come in, and they're cursing at my father about the union. They're union guys, and he's non-union. And they're cursing, they're abusing the shit out of him. My father doesn't even look like it's phasing him, like nothing's happening. They walk out, and I say, who are they? This is the union people. Don't worry about it. That's what it means. They, they said they're going to come back tomorrow. And if you don't straighten this out, you, you don't have money, they're going to beat you up. They're going to do this. They'll break your legs. He says, don't worry about it. My gumbada, Suvito, he'll t I talk to him. They'll take care of this. They got big mouths. Don't worry about it. Don't do nothing. So I went back to the gang that night and told my friends. This guy, Jerry Papa, was the head of our, the leader of the gang, and I told him. So I said, I'm going to take a couple of guys. We go in with me in the factory. When they come back, if they raise their hands, we're going to break every bone in their body. So Jerry opens up his jacket. He says, Sammy, nah, forget about it. Fine. Look, he's got a gun. He says, if they raise their hands to your father, kill them. Give us a call. We'll come and get rid of the bodies and the gun and everything. Don't worry about it. Now, I never killed anybody. I never even thought of killing somebody. I was physical with my hands. I took the gun and I put it under my belt. They raised their hands to my father. I'm going to kill them. So I go there. And the next day they come in. I'm ready. They turn around and they tell my father, why didn't you tell us that Zuvito is your gumbara? Why didn't you tell us, Jerry? And they're talking sweet to him. If you have any problems with anybody, give us a call. They're giving them their card. Give us a call. We'll take care of you. You stay non-union. Don't worry about it. And they leave. So I come out. I said, Dad, what the hell was that? 
been talking about Cerrito. Now, I knew the guy because he was my father's good brother. He was smaller than my father, and he was this big. This thin. A good wind could knock him on his ass. What the hell are these big six, two, six, three guys? What are they worried about him? I didn't understand the mafia. So my father says, I told you. We honest people. We work. If we have trouble, we go to people like Cerrito, and they take care of these problems. Don't, don't be excited. So I said, well... That wouldn't happen. I would have took care of this. How would you take care of these people? And I opened up my shirt and I showed him the gun. My father, that's the first time I thought he was going to hit me. He flipped out. Give me that gun. We don't do that. I told you we're legitimate people. That's the kind of people they want. Sammy, are you alpha or is your dad alpha? Like, you know, just because it's a dad doesn't mean one is a bigger alpha than the other one. Did you have more of an alpha spirit than him? Oh, I'm much more of an alpha than him. You're much more than him. So let me ask you. How much of you becoming who you became has to do with your environment and how much of it has to do with your DNA and your wiring and the way you're born? Environment, experiences, teacher, eight, three, dyslexic, bullying, punching a principal versus your DNA, your wiring. I believe it's the neighborhood, the environment is, is one thing. I don't think it's my DNA. If there was help in schools, I could have graduated. I, I got out of the eighth grade. That was my last day in school. I never even went to high school. I ran unions and businesses all over New York. It shocked the whole world what I did. It's in every book, every movie. I've met with lawyers and dealt with lawyers. When I look at them, I said, my God, what, are you, what do you have? The lexicon, what'd you do? In other words, you went to school, you passed some tests. He's dumber than wood. I think I'm smarter than that. So I don't think I can't learn. I sit down and I've done businesses all day long. I just got out of prison not even two years. September will be two years. Mm. I'm sitting down going forward in Hollywood. I'm working on a podcast, a lot of content about my life. It's not an easy thing to get to that point. I'm working on a book, possible school show down the road. And I sit down with businessmen all the time. I sit down with guys, producers and heavyweights in Hollywood. And they say, a couple of them told me, Sammy, you talk and talk like a gangster. You're rough talking. You curse a little bit. You talk rough. But you're super fucking smart. You're coming up. You just got into this industry. And you're making moves and talking with people like you've been here 100 years. So I told them, when your kids are born, make sure it's election. And they'll, they'll be good too. But I, can, I have enough brains. I related to when I watch the news and I, all the time. These kids will go out and shoot people. The news asks a million questions. Just like you asked. Why? How come? We're going to gun control. What's guns got to do with it? Now, I'll put my criminal hat on. Go ahead. Do gun control. Take away guns from all the good people. I will always have a gun. Every criminal will always have a gun. It doesn't come from different states. It could come from different countries. And if you were, probably when you were younger, you heard the thing, a zip gun. They can make a gun. I, we made silencers. So that's not going to help nobody. What it's going to do is a girl is home with her kids. Some guy is stalking her. He wants a rape her. But he's always questioning, if I keep that door in to protect our kids and herself, she might have a gun and blow my head off. But take away all of that protection. She's going to get slaughtered. What about how many times do people with legitimate guns save so many people or stop somebody who's completely out of their mind? This is a problem of people growing up. The first problem at home. We all know our kids, our own kids. You know if the kid's a little weird or he's a little upset and he's not thinking right. You know it. But nobody will ever call the cops or anybody. On their kids. They feel like they're giving their kids up. It's a normal reaction. He's going to be great. You wait and see. He'll, he'll change. He gets worse. So now he goes to school. The teachers see it, but there's so many laws and rules. If the teacher says, I'm going to send Jimmy to psych, the family will sue. He'll, he'll, he'll get fired. So you're tying the hands of teachers. So this kid just goes and goes and goes. By the time he goes out and shoots, go for the 14 people, there's always a line of people saying, yeah, when you look back, I, I knew this kid would be the worst, but nobody ever said nothing or did nothing. 
That's environment. That's not the lexic. That's not a slow liner because the school system should never. If I wouldn't have been called the lexic, or if they would have known how to treat it, I don't know what I would have been. I might have been a doctor. I might have been a lawyer. I really don't know. Oh, so you do believe you could have gone a different direction if somebody got a hold of you early? Oh, absolutely. Okay, so this is so. Absolutely. Got it. So you did say there was environment, but now you're saying if somebody worked with you, tutored you, developed you, maybe you would have got a different direction. Absolutely. I'm saying the same thing now about these kids who shoot people. If you would have grabbed those people years ago right. and said, there's a problem with this kid, let's tutor him. Let's send him to special places. Let's take care of him. Mm. Maybe that kid, when he's 16, 18, 21, whatever the hell he is, he won't be shooting all these people. The kid is bent. It's not the gun. Now, if you took all the guns away and one of these kids run into a disco and he cuts loose with a bomb, instead of shooting 14 people, 60 people are dead. Are you happy? You don't have a gun. What are you going to say then? Oh, we shouldn't have bombs? Of course we shouldn't have bombs. But it's the kid. We're never going to the problem. And they always ask this stupid question. What can we do? How can we stop it? You can't. The guy is nuts. Even gangs, street gangs, the mafia, they don't run around shooting innocent people. We shoot each other when we break rules. We don't run around shooting innocent people. People will tell you live in tough neighborhoods, dying neighborhoods for years ago. The mafia was actually a safe place for them. They didn't allow a rapist or a child molester. I'll give you an example. I'm in front of my place I hang out. And there's this beautiful woman, she had a baby, now she's back in shape, she's not that gorgeous, and she's walking. She walks right past where we stay. We're sitting outside with beach chairs talking. It's not like the movies, people hooting and howling. Maybe on a construction crew, but we don't do that. I tell my people, you do that, this is our people, this is our neighborhood. Don't do that. If I hear you doing something, no, Sam, we know we ain't gonna do that. So you'd say to yourself, she knows she's dropped that gorgeous. Why is she walking right past us on our side of the street? You know the answer? She feels safer? Absolutely. She don't want to walk on the other side because people will not, ooh, now she's liable to get raped or robbed or something. And when I say the other side, it could be around the block. She's comfortable here. She knows she's not going to get hurt. Her husband allows her. Yeah, go on 18th there. Go right past them. Stay by them. Because we wouldn't allow none to happen to her. There's a different vibe. I mean, even though they're, you know, like people say, he's a killer. He was involved in 19 murders. I was involved in three mafia wars. I was involved in two different families. You could say whatever you want to say. But the reality is like, what do we do to stop this? Change the environment. Change the kid who's sick coming up. Change the kid who's dyslexic. Do something to help these intervene then. Years ago, they, there was when I was a kid growing up, there was mental institutions. Then they took them away. There's no mental institutions. I heard Trump saying, we better start building them again. I bet your sweet ass you should, you should start building them again. Put people in there, not to do time, but to rehabilitate them, to help them. Look what we have in cities. We have zones where safe for, for people who are committing crimes. There's so many stupid laws that it's pathetic. It's tying the hands of everybody and it's deteriorating the country. So you're for Second Amendment? Oh, absolutely. That would be an understatement. And this is uh, coming from a former underboss who, for the criminal, if they banned guns, they would have an edge. And you're saying to keep the guns is going to keep the citizens safer. Absolutely. Listen, how many shootings are there? 10, 20, 30? There's 300 and something million people in this country. Mm. The, the numbers just don't jive. And, and there, how many guns are out there? They say 200 million guns. So you had 30 shootings. I mean, that's nothing. How many car accidents did you have? How many drunken drivers killed people? How many? Do we take cars away? We try and control the person who's drinking and driving. We have to control the people who are going to have guns. Listen, I'm for the Second Amendment. But I do think, on the other hand, looking at it the other way, I used to go hunting. I would shoot a rifle. That was a bolt action. I missed the deer. I bolted again. Boom. Missed the deer. He got away. They have guns now that shoot 100 bullets 
with a semi-automatic like a machine gun. So in 10 seconds, he could unload 200 bullets. Do you need 200 bullets to kill a deer? No. So they can limit some of that power. Those, and I was in the military, so those are military guns, a 30 caliber, the thing that knock half of your body off when you get hit. What do you need a 30 caliber for? Why do they need a, a 30 caliber? You need a gun to protect your house. 38, a handgun, a shotgun, a gun that it, with a bolt that only shoots one at a time is fine. You can protect your family. She can protect herself. So I, I, I agree with that. There's too much power. And when you get a nut and you give him that much power, then you're, you're waiting for something major to happen. So you leave 16, 17 years old, and you go in the military, you become a corporal in the U.S. Army. I think you serve two years honorable discharge. You go to Fort Jackson, uh, South Carolina. You're working as a, I think as a cook, was your MOS. Then you get out. How did you get introduced to Colombo, and then how did you go from there to Gambino? Well, I was introduced by, as soon as I got out of the Army at 21, I wasn't a cook. I was a uh, uh, communications. I worked in the kitchen and had a problem in the kitchen one time, and it involved racism. There was a black guy serving, and I was serving next to him on the line, and a couple of hillbillies came by. I know I knew about racism, but not like this. I saw it in South Carolina. It was a whole different level. I never saw it like this. So when he went to him, the black guy right in front of me, he's calling him, boy this, boy that. Go get that, boy. Give me more, boy. And I'm listening. Black guy was a pretty strong looking guy. He didn't seem to phase him not. Didn't bother him not. And then the guy came to me. He started with me. Because they look at I came from New York. Hey boy, fill my tray. So I got this long metal spoon, I'm filling this the compartment with the beans or whatever it was, and it's starting to drip over. So I stop. And he looks at me and he says, he throws everything on the counter. And he said, Boy, when I tell you whoop it on me. You whoop it on me. And he's got an empty tray and he puts it back out. Whoop it on me, huh? And I whack him with the spoon in the head. And he goes flying back. But I wasn't all that smart because the next two guys were his friends. And his friend hits me with a tray. And I go flying backwards a little bit. And the black guy from the Bronx, we were friendly. He jumps over the thing and he starts throwing punches. I get back over. The whole place is in the half of we're fighting like crazy. So we're sitting, the MPs come, we're sitting on the floor, me and the black guy, and uh, a sergeant comes. He's 78, something like that. Uh, he's in charge of the MPs, and he's a big black guy. And he looks at me and he said, you like helping black people, boy? He thinks that I jumped in to help him, but it was the other way around. But I'm not a jerk. I was gonna take advantage of it. I said, well, that's what you do. I'm from New York. I don't believe in this bullshit. And he winks at me, so I know I'm not in trouble. And I'm never online again. I'm in the back with him, peeling potatoes when we come up. So that's what I was. But I, in the Army, I was in communications. So when I get out, I get out at 21. I'm right back in the rampers. Not even one day. I go to the family, and I go right to the rampers. Two years, I'm back. And then at the age of 23, a friend of mine, Tommy Spiro, says his uncle... Shorty Spiro, his name was Tommy as well, wants to see me. And then he's a heavyweight guy. He's in the Colombo family, he's very well known, a heavyweight. He was in the original Gallo War. So I meet with him and he says, listen, I hear a lot of good things about you. I know a lot of things about you. You're going to get killed. He said, you're too damn tough. You don't want to listen. You can't run around. You're not hooked up. You got to hook up with people. I would like you to be with me. I will never lie to you. I will never backstab. Whatever I asked you to do, I already did. It was music to my ear. He says, in my crew, you're going to be part of my family. I joined up. I went with him. I started having trouble with Carmi Persico. Not trouble. I, he, was, he was using me to do things. Give this guy a beat and do this, do that. And I was doing all those things. Now, his brother, Ralph Sparrow, wanted to put his son in. So he has an argument with Shorty. Why do you keep bringing Sammy to Junior? And he said, listen, bro, I don't bring him there. Junior's asking for him to come down when he tells me. And I bring him down. So a lot of jealousy, 
on behind my back. I didn't know that was happening. And uh, at one point, there was a guy with us, Ralph Ivanga. He went on a, a stick up with another crew. And uh, he gets into a, a gun battle with three or four detectives. And he gets hit 11 times and dies. I'm in Ships at Bay in a real dark, dingy, bullshit bar talking to the old man, Johnny Rizzo, who's a main guy, a couple of other people, Louis Melito, Michael Mbada, Alley Boy, and a few other people are talking, and this beautiful looking blonde comes in, short skirt, high heels, big blonde hair. In those days, I used to tease it, it's, and she comes in with a guy, well, blue guy, and they sit at the other end of the bar, very dark, man. you could hardly see them. I mean, you see them, but you can't recognize who they are. The old man Rizzo tells me, he says, Sam, I think this girl uh, is trying to make a play for you. She's eyeballing you. I think he's breaking my chops because we always break each other's chops for things. So I said, come on, John. She's sitting with a guy. We're going to talk. We're going to wind up in a, in a fight. Come on, stop. And we keep talking. Louis Molino tells me, Sam, I don't think he's breaking your chops. She's looking at you every two seconds. Oh, you, you stupid, you don't see it? I can hardly see it. So how do you know she's, she's looking this way? How do you know she's looking at me? She's looking at you. All of a sudden, a guy gets up and goes to the bathroom. And she gets up and starts walking towards us. Rizzo hits me in the, in the back. I told you, go over and see what she wants. So I walk over, and who is it? I'm about as close as I am to you. It's Ralph Fiwanga's wife. He's dead a, a week and a half. I look at her, and I, she didn't have that hair like that. She never looked like that to me. And I said, what are you doing? Your husband just died. Who's this guy? She said, Sammy, life goes on. Life goes on. He's not even fucking cold yet. You can't wait a while? He says, I see the way you used to look at me. Maybe I could get rid of maybe me. What? Get the fuck away. I, I went into a rage with her. She we got terrified. She left. The guy left. When the guy came out, we told him. He said, what's the matter? Get her and get out while you can go. So he did. The next day she went to Ralph and told Ralph. So Ralph takes this as a thing. This is, he's going to undermine me. He don't know there's all them people there. He's going to make up a story that I try to make her. She wouldn't go with me and I'm abusing her. He calls my wife and tells my wife, Junior, come my personal, is going to kill your fucking husband. He tried to make Ralph Ranga's wife. He's dead and he hangs up on my wife. My wife really is not a, a typical gangster's wife. I come home, she's hysterical crying. What did you do? What are you talking about what I did? What, what did I do? What are you crying about? And she says, you tried to make Ralph his wife? What are you, crazy? Who told you that? Ralph called me and told me. And she told me everything he said. So I said, Dad, listen to me, baby. Stop crying. This life is so technical. Make sure that every word you tell me is exactly right. Tell it to me again. If there's anything wrong, we're through. She tells me the same story. She can't even stop crying. I go inside. I go in the drawer. I get a gun. I get in my car and I go to Ralph's house. I go to the door and we were like good fellas. We all live together. <clears throat> so Ann, his wife, comes to the door. Hey, Sammy, what's up? I says, I had taken out the gun. I had it by my, the back by my ass. As soon as he came to the door, I was going to kill him. Right in front of Ann. And I was so hot. She said, did something go wrong? Ralph took off an hour or two ago. Is there a problem? No, there's no problem. Just tell him I was here. So when I went to turn to walk, she saw the gun. Mm. And she told Shorty and Ralph. And he came to the house with a gun to kill Ralph. So there's, I'm going to supposed to get a tremendous beating. They're going to set me up. The old man Rizzo comes to me and found out about it and said, don't go to this meeting. I said, no, no. how can I not go? These are my people. John, this is none of your business. You're in, you're with the Gambinos. It's none of your business. That's what you're going to be told. You can't do nothing for me. So what do you got to do? So what do you want me to do? Run away? I didn't do nothing. So he stays with me. We go and see Shorty. Shorty gets together and says, listen, John, this is none of your business. But John tells him, listen, it's none of my business. You're right. But I want to tell you what I saw. And he tells him exactly what happened. He said, Louis Melito, who's in the car, you want him to come in? He was there. Ali Boy was with the Genovese people. He was there. Mikey, who's with 